Welcome Climate Viewers, this is Jim Lee from Climate Viewer News at ClimateViewer.com, ClimateViewer.org, and WeatherModificationHistory.com. With facts minus fear porn and here we're today with a very special guest. Um, my longtime Climate Viewers will probably already know the name David Miles. Uh, I've been covering his company, uh, previous company, Acquiescent, 2014. And I finally have the pleasure of interviewing him tonight. And we're going to talk about weather modification, atmospheric rivers, and weather moderation. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you all to the CEO of Miles Research, David Miles. It's good to have you on the show, David, and I appreciate you doing this interview. Um, could you tell us a little bit about your education and how you got into weather modification? Thanks, Jim, and thanks, uh, viewers. Um, yeah, so I was introduced to um, agriculture through family connections. My grandfather's side was dairy farming, uh, uh, but I grew up always quite inventive and quite interested in uh, developing solutions to problems and uh, initially I, I was able to present a, a solar tracking uh, system that would follow the sun and heat water uh, to um, the science junior talent search in Canberra, Australia and I won some award then from uh, that was given by Prince Charles for, uh, for a device that for this device that was able to demonstrate that it could follow the sun. Uh, but I guess um, I then uh, went to university, uh, went through secondary and then university studying industrial design, where I was able to develop more of the skill set needed to take concepts through to manufacturing. Uh, and there particularly was able to um, develop some ideas and tools and then get work, experiencing, uh, work experience following the degree uh, in industrial design that again helped me to realize you know how to work with industry how to contract out components how to work with teams and so on so eventually then um, working in industrial design uh, actually in the 90s I became very frustrated being paid by the hour uh, and working through early hours of the morning and realized there's got to be more to what I can contribute than just creating um, you know, prototypes and things for other people who manufacture and get highly paid. So I started to really dig deep and uh, have faith in God. I, I was praying, surely it's got to be a better way. And, and I realised that uh, since early days I'd had an interest in how the environment and technology could overlap and we could potentially solve environmental problems with technology solutions. Uh, and given now the advances in computing, communications, satellite meteorology and other um, tools that really have become available, I was able to then start to approach the problem of weather and weather-related disasters um, and uh, attempted to uh, bring rain in New South Wales for a drought in Cobar in around 1998. And uh, we were able to successfully get rain and I, I spoke to my accountant and he felt we should set up a, a company, which we did at the time, and we set up two. We set up Sovereignty and we set up Acquiesce. Um, now, Acquiesce is a name many may know. We, we went to the United Nations in 2011 and, and ran a demonstration uh, and presented in Rome uh, with Acquiesce uh, for a breaking of a drought across the Horn of Africa. But just coming back to those early days, um, the vision was acquiesce a company that could address uh, rainfall needs for agriculture and for humanitarian purposes, and then sovereignty uh, to become the, the mother company, if you like, that would then allow us to roll out acquiesce and then other services globally. So the goal was a global service offering uh, for corporate, for humanitarian, for government, for even insurance as well for private industry. So um, I was able to then uh, basically uh, get that going, get a few share shareholders on board, and uh, I transferred from working in industrial design 
through to uh, weather modification, if you like, uh, which we've now sort of toned it down a little bit to weather moderation. Um, does that cover enough, Jim? You oh, sorry. Want to dig in there? Cer certainly. So that, that opens the door for uh, my next question. Um, you know, I, I talked a, a lot about when I first found your company in 2014, I was fascinated by the technology. Um, you know, I talk a lot about weather modification history. And what you're talking about seems to be weather modification future. So there's a big difference there. And what I'm what I was really interested and caught by was your rain aid program, which you previously mentioned. Um, and for those who don't know, the idea was to bring rain to the Horn of Africa um, through manipulating atmospheric rivers or the, the direction that the clouds were flying. Um, and the claim was made that, you know, signals were sent from ground-based receivers. And immediately, you know, my radar just jumped off the chart because, you know, that's a fascination of mine. That's a fascination of my audience. Um, the connection between electromagnetic radiation and weather. Um, could you please explain, you know, a little bit more about the Rain Aid program, um, how it worked? And this was when you were the CEO of Acquiesce. Uh, I believe it was 2010 through 11. Is that correct? Uh, well, actually, uh, Acquiesce was set up. There was one of the companies, I think it was Acquiesce in 2000, sorry, in 1999 and uh, Sovereignty, I think, in 2001. Uh, and so all that time we were running a lot of uh, Australian-based projects and some demonstrations for government. We did some for farmers in 2006. Uh, got canned in the media, courtesy of the government, in 2006. And then um, finally, I did some private projects for two years and then uh, started to develop an opportunity to work overseas. Then, uh, so I was CEO of Aquius all that time and uh, perhaps navigating blindly, I think, with no experience as CEO and no real training as to how to engage a market. We, we pretty much went by, you know, the humanitarian bent, which basically, uh, you know, we did a lot of work. We've got some unique and great results with on-target rain, culminating in, in the 2011 project where we announced it in Rome. We said that in 45 days we'll bring rain into the Horn of Africa to break the drought. And by saying that, we meant we'd bring a commencement of rain, which we'd follow on for multiple months. And we even said that we wouldn't bring heavy rain in 45 days. We'll bring gentle rain so that the cattle could get some food. So you get initial grass regrowth, the, the, the cattle start feeding and start producing milk. And then the human resilience goes back up once they're drinking milk and, and eating cheese and they, they derive a lot of food from the, from the goats, uh, particularly in the Horn of Africa, and they, they milk the blood from the neck of the goat and uh, they, they, milk, they drink the milk as well and create cheese and mix that with flour. And that, that all becomes their sustainable food supply and they still keep the goat, whereas perhaps other countries we kill the goat and, uh, you know, there goes your food supply. But um, so we were going to bring in designer rain, gentle rain initially for uh, the first half to a full month. And then once the, the milk's being produced and human resilience goes up, we're going to bring in much heavier rain to break the drought. So that was the objective. And then we pre-announced it. We went to Kenya and met with some United Nations people and had meetings and so on. And then um, and, and also some of the victims of the famine. And uh, following which then we commenced the project and we went back to Rome and spoke again and commenced the project and brought the rain and significantly got, uh, got results there. So CEO of Acquies has been a journey for sure. Um, during the period, I managed to sell most of my shares in, uh, in the company. Um, and so Acquies became acquired by 
uh, sovereignty, the mother company, if you like, and the shareholders still reside in sovereignty. Again, I sold most of my shares to survive um, whilst running multiple demonstrations, including a couple in America, of course. Uh, but uh, then, have just to finish this uh, story off, uh, then we've set up Miles Research really to allow me to still take a piece of the income that we might generate and as well as looking after the original shareholders. So again, perhaps I haven't been as ruthless as other company operators might have been. Um, some of the original shareholders are just sitting on the fence waiting, hoping, uh, but we've looked after them to the best of our ability and uh, Miles Research is really navigating a path forward. Um, again, I'm still at the helm. Uh, we've got the technology working and been able to demonstrate substantially, particularly here locally in Australia in the last three years. Um, and we look forward to now cutting in with some commercial offering, hopefully this year, that will generate income both for Miles Research and the shareholders of Aqueous, which are now reside in the mother company, Sovereignty. Okay, so so basically, were, were, was the goal of this to steer atmospheric rivers or was it to just shift clouds? I mean, what, what exactly was the goal of Rain Aid? Okay, so uh, the particular problem there, uh, we set up Rain Aid to go and to run this project there to give it an easy reference name. Uh, and the problem they were facing is basically the blocking high pressure systems that was steering all the main rain systems away from the Horn of Africa so that they weren't receiving their normal seasonal rains. Uh, there is some documentation, Jim, which I think you've got access to, and certainly people are able to get a hold of that with more detail. But our goal was to then hack into the, the blocking system and ultimately remove it, initially to get some rain in and then you know work with the balance of the two the the lower pressure and the and the atmospheric rivers if you like uh which would then be able to um get the general rain but not eliminate the blocking system totally straight away and then basically to cut in and and then remove the blocking system and and re-establish a normal rainfall season so um just coming back to atmospheric rivers the atmospheric rivers are, are really the macro um, pathways that moisture takes throughout the atmosphere around the Earth. So you've got your more micro systems of evaporation and the cloud formation and, and your rains, local rains and patterns. But as you understand, the, the Earth being a sphere, it has some naturally forming annual and seasonal uh, flow patterns on a more mac macro level and which travel internationally and globally. So uh, what we were noticing was all the evapotranspiration of the moisture was avoiding the Horn of Africa at the time. So our job really is to troubleshoot that and then to uh, create a workaround or to create a, a mitigation of that, uh, which would then basically um, attack the blocking system and uh, disassemble it from its effective position, which is the same uh, same approach we've taken last year here in Australia to mitigate a blocking system over eastern Australia and to get rain in on target and on time. So, you know, this is one of our tools, I suppose, in the toolbox, is that we understand what causes a drought and that it is a macro scale effect of significant atmospheric patterns and that we've developed a, a, a tool set if you like a, a set of capabilities that can be applied systematically over a period of time to achieve a mitigation or, or basically disassembling that uh, fairly formidable system to so get in the if I, if I, might, if I may um, we have we have something simple similar um, in North America that has been re referred to as the ridiculously resilient ridge have you ever heard that term? Yeah. And, you know, uh, I, I there was a group called the Arctic Methane Emergency Group uh, who called for unblocking of, you know, these large mesoscale, you know, weather patterns where, you know, high pressure zones build up. 
And, you know, you, you have, especially in the Horn of Africa, um, you know, what, what you might call a heat island, um, mixed with overseeding of the sky. Um, and, you know, for those who aren't familiar with cloud seeding, uh, African dust is ripe with aluminum min minerals and the alumina silicate minerals are great at forming clouds and forming rain. Um, in fact, African dust has been found in this, you know, central Midwest of, uh, the United States of America. So, I mean, this travels worldwide and is the predominant source of atmospheric aluminum that produces clouds worldwide. And similarly, the atmospheric river you're talking about um, generally runs around the equator, but you know, with the Saharan desert, you know, it, it, it kind of interrupts that whole process. So I, I guess a better question is, you know, in your documentation, it said that signals are sent from ground-based modules. C could you describe that part a little bit better for me? Okay, sure. So earlier on, we were developing a single uh, system that would be able to be deployed, and we met with some people from the U.S. Uh, representing a, a three-letter agency there, and they advised that it may be appropriate to have more of a disparate-based um, facility where we can't easily be identified and then owned, uh, if you could understand. So they had seen some work that we'd done in the early 2000s, quite significant. Um, and so we took some of that advice, including um, really to create a, uh, a, an ability to hide in plain sight so that our systems, for the time that we haven't had the resourcing to build a proper defence-grade bunker, uh, we've had to hide in plain sight and come up with a way to uh, create really disparate operating platform, uh, which is essentially offline, but it enabled us to launch multiple signals to triangulate targets and to relatively... Um, stay out of harm's way, I guess. So it was interesting taking advice from these guys at the same time. Um, we realised that they may have a vested interest in what we were doing and there was a short, uh, there was a relationship there for a while um, with ad these advisors from the three-letter agency, but they, um, they did bill us for their time and advice and a couple of trips and we, I ran out of spare cash to keep paying them and we parted ways. But... Um, I think it's quite good advice in that we haven't really had any major security issues uh, and we're only now really converging on how to build this bunker in a, in a sensible manner with the visibility to Australian government so that we're not just playing games, uh, you know, trying to avoid the understanding of the authorities, but at the same time we, we need mutual respect. Uh, we want to be commercially viable to be able to then also run humanitarian projects. So I'm sorry we're not able to give too much more detail uh, other than that we've developed a signal um, that when we can break the signal down into multiple launch stations, that we're able to launch, if you like, the, the different signals uh, in, in a component manner and have them assemble or tri triangulate and execute over the target. So bear in mind, sometimes our target may be geospatially located and other times our target might be atmospheric dynamics. So there's no geospatial target, but there's a dynamic in the atmosphere flow pattern that we're targeting. So it's interesting when you look at that. Uh, we've absolutely tried to come up with a way to best articulate it and to be friendly to both the scientific community and to perhaps the uninitiated and there is a white paper on my website that people are free to grab a look at. It's six or seven pages, and uh, they can get that off milesresearch.co, um, the website. And uh, that's to try and really explain how do we target an atmospheric pattern and what kinds of changes are we able to make uh, that will lead to such a macro effect. 
And uh, to be fair, um, you know, I think I've guarded, I've ended up, Jim, guarding the signal with my life. It's my life's work and we've come to a place where we can basically execute on any major threat event within our range of, of uh, target, for example, here in Australia. Yep. Yeah, I was going to give an, a, give another example. It sounds very yep. similar to what you're talking about. Um, a guy from the Arctic Methane Emergency Group, once again, uh, Malcolm P.R. Light, uh, he described something called Project Lucy, or detection and energization of atmospheric methane using three high-powered microwave transmitters coinciding on the same location um, with a 13.5 megahertz frequency to actually compress atmospheric methane into diamonds and because they have a similar structure and that that would create noctilucent clouds and destroy the methane at the same time. Um, and it, it sounds kind of similar to what you're describing here where you use multiple different signal sources which are all focused on the same location to generate, you know, a change in the atmosphere. Um, so just, just, you know, without going too far into it, we are talking about electromagnetic signals or are we talking about acoustic signals? Just, just okay. generally. Okay, we're talking about an electromagnetic signal, but uh, our delivery, we're not using um, particle beams or, you know, energy beams. We're using... Uh, we've basically come across a waveform that we're able to to launch, uh, if you like, more of a gentle or a um, uh, this just a a signal that is um, what's the you know the uh, the Malam Malamo um, you know there was an aircraft with almost a very light plastic wing. It was a man powered um, bicycle driven aircraft that went around around the world, uh, I understand. Um, there's a word, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just looking for. I, I but know what you're talking the, about. I, I remember the, the, the bike around, <laughs> but go ahead. Yeah, yeah. you know, the fragile, uh, the, the fragile yet quite powerful. Um, we've, we've basically understood how the atmosphere works to the degree that our signal is not a uh, energy Pulse, it's going to damage potentially, uh, you know, life form in the target area. Um, but rather, really, we're working with the signals the atmosphere itself produces and is interrelating with the environment um, in in its relationship. So that, uh, as as you know, the atmospheric flow paths often will follow forests and and other um, other existing uh, life. Um, uh, forms or life behavior on the surface, not to mention, of course, terrain. And then you've got the forces of the, the heating and the cooling and the heat transfers from the surface and from the ocean. But, uh, but we found a way to perhaps interfere with the boundary layer behaviors to harden and soften the viscosity of boundary layers between the pressure systems that affects then the the path of least resistance that the rain system will travel so that by affecting boundary layer hardness uh, with our signal we're able to reset if you like the labyrinth through which the rain systems travel and therefore that, adjust. Makes, that makes perfect sense okay so okay. so the, the you know i when i first started covering you know the claims of acquiesce um, many debunkers, you know, famous debunking websites say, well, you know, all of these claims are fake. Uh, and, you know, of course, they cited the fact that the Acquiesce website disappeared as their number one evidence that your, your claims were fake. And clearly, you have not disappeared. Um, and you've explained what happened with Acquiesce. So I think we've covered that pretty well. Um, the World Meteorological uh, Organization's expert team on weather modification held a uh, 2010 special meeting in Abu Dhabi to denounce cloud ionization claims from a company called WeatherTech. 
Um, and they said, weather modification technologies that claim to achieve such large scale or dramatic effects do not have a sound base sound scientific basis, e.g. hail cannons, ionization me methods, and should be treated with suspicion. Um, how would you rep uh, respond to this claim that, you know, this is all, um, you know, just speculation? Um, and, you know, I've seen, you know, every piece of uh, literature you've put out, and you seem to back up every, th every claim that you're making with you know, rainfall measurement changes and, you know, um, all of that sort of thing. So how would you respond to, to their claims that this is much to do of nothing? Okay. Um, very good. Well, I think uh, it's very important to understand the United Nations have quite a responsibility, uh, given that they're empowered by many nations to um, to govern and to perhaps to create the frameworks for developments and safety thresholds and so on. But in regards to this uh, and my experience uh, of meeting with them since then, which was 2011, um, is that they're, uh, they seem quite naive to the commercial world and what's happening and perhaps even subject to powers that be or major influences that um, that contribute or otherwise to their funding so that they have a line they can take, they have a line they don't take. Uh, I was surprised to see the global warming material and climate change uh, that they've completely ignored the, uh, the contribution defence and wars have to damaging the climate and the planet. And well, I'm shocked. Before you go any further, and to mention uh, solar cycles, aerosol cloud interaction and i could go on for an hour about what's not been in those ipcc reports but aerosol cloud interaction still remains to be the the greatest unknown in climate science but please go on, go on yeah thanks jim great um so just in a nutshell then uh i wanted to refer to one of the contributors to the wmo was a meteorologist in kenya and uh is they um, they contribute to WMO uh, out of Nairobi. I don't have his name off um, on uh, call at the moment, but he published a one-page ad against acquiesce uh, as we were approaching United Nations and meeting with the United Nations. He published in uh, Nairobi a, a whole page denouncing us and that they were the authority for um, for drought for Kenya and so on and in the end we uh, we ignored them and we were just surprised how negative they were uh, in in directly responding to this uh, we've never really had a proper meeting or discussion with WMO uh, we have a solution we've demonstrated it in plain sight in front of United Nations I think that they are behind the eight ball um, and that there is much that they probably know of that's that's surging ahead, uh, modifying our atmosphere, that they simply are not commenting on at the moment. And it probably suits a lot of people that there's a lag time between perhaps the, the types of things that uh, are mentioned by the likes of John Brennan uh, talking about SAI, um, stratospheric, atmospheric, in, oh, sorry, aerosol injections, um, you know, I'm not up to date, Jim, with as much material as you are on the general playing field. But in terms of a lag time, it's quite convenient uh, that, you know, this could be discussed as potentially having an influence in the future uh, to help solve climate change. And, um, you know, whereas it may be that it's currently being used to, to disrupt national economies around the planet and I'm just concerned that military is operating largely unchecked. And so I hopefully have developed a solution which will be a, a suitable countermeasure that can be suitable for population centers and um, growing regions around the world. So our aim is, is not to take on the military, of course, or the governments at this stage, but to produce a solution which can provide localised countermeasures that can mitigate the effects of a large blocking system or a, an apparent climate change effect that's damaging an economy in a, a region where you've got 
farmers, uh, like in Australia, the, the suicide rate's been very high amongst farmers who are under pressure by banks to borrow more money. Then when more drought comes, the banks want to take their farms and they can lose uh, family properties that have been in their family lines for, for generations. And uh, sadly, there's, there's you know, a very high number of suicides. So we've tried to come up with a way to intervene and, and offer at just about no cost a way to solve uh, the drought for a region. And we want to then offer this globally. Uh, we're working on getting a couple of backers for this year, 2019, to scale up a more public demonstration again. We did it last year. We've done two events, which we pre-announced last year. And we're now wanting to go to scale it, to target regions so that there is a pre-announced border of our uh, project and a timeline for the project to get the rain in um, and to then bring timely rain that will help crops and uh, and a region so that we can eventually scale it globally. So um, I think I think that I would challenge anyone that wants to say this is just rubbish to first look at existing results that we've put up. Um, I'm about to do a reiteration of the website so that it's a bit more commercial. Right now, you've just got an accumulation of a lot of years of pain and suffering and uh, enduring getting projects going and a few farmers pitching in. I've, I've just put sort of it's it's become layers there uh, and the website's not so um, commercial. but. We're hoping to offer a um, crowdfunded based uh, service that will allow a region to crowdfund its own rain. And in the same way, we want to put a commercial offering for catchment authorities and for insurance companies that want to intervene against, say, a hail. Weather or risk or mitigation. Yeah, yeah. So there's probably four markets. So we, the crowdfunding will be for farmers. We want to try and do this scale to Australia and then scale to global. Um, at, at the same time, we want to facilitate our bunker and, and a, a facility that will cope with concurrent endeavours, you know, to no, from 10 to 60 concurrent endeavours um, on any given day. But um, at the moment, we're just working on the model, I suppose, and then the pricing template, etc. cetera, uh, to debunk that and, and to challenge anyone that wants to be sceptical, I think, Firstly, uh, we, we've demonstrated in, uh, openly and um, this most recent one we announced uh, and the details are in the white paper that's freely available on the homepage of my website. Uh, we announced... Which, on the I, which I have read as well and it, it's excellent. Okay. okay. Uh, I just want to mention, um, Jim, we just announced on the 20th of September that because the rain, spring rains hadn't come and farmers were rapidly losing their, their crops for the year, uh, last year, we announced that within 20 days we would bring timely rain for the Wimmera as a primary target, as a secondary target, the two states, Victoria and New South Wales, to try and help the drought. That was more compassion um, than commercial, uh, but we, we did that. So we got um, a good soaking one-day rain that hadn't been predicted right over the Wimmera target on the uh, on the 9th and 10th of October. So the 10th of October was the expiry date of that demonstration. That was 20 days. And on the 9th and 10th, we got the event in and it really did hit the Wimmera target pretty accurately. And uh, the, the farmers here say, and the newspaper here says that it was worth hundreds of millions to the Wimmera because their crops, which is for this region, it's, um, you know, in the, around about a billion dollars or, or more in value, um, that they would lose those crops, you know, without that rain. And although uh, I got complaints from farmers, they said, well, we wanted two and three inches, not one inch. Um, they failed to realise that without that one inch, they would have uh, would have been in, in serious harm's way. So uh, I, I guess my answer's always been we've demonstrated and we can demonstrate uh, I. I think that um, WMO has to err on the side of caution, and I respect that, and I would too I, if I, I was I think you were a little closer to the truth whenever you were, were talking about the stratospheric aerosol injection. And, you know, for us, you know, we've, we've talked quite often about the climate changers. And, you know, honestly, we're, we're in a place now where 
um, you know, they're, they're really conflating a whole lot of things and omitting a whole lot of things. And it, it's clear to me that the, the WMO's expert team on weather modification are aware of all of these research efforts. Um, you know, they know what's effective and what isn't. And while they continue to push that, and, and you hear it on, especially in America, I don't know how it is in Australia, but in America, we hear all the time, you know, that the the hurricanes are more damaging because of climate change that you know the tornadoes everything fires drought everything is everything that comes back to co2 um but there are people who you know have a vested interest a monetary interest in you know uh dead farmers and uh you know it's it's sad to say but it's true um, you know, Morganization or what JP Morgan did back in the day, you know, that there is competition, uh, between, you know, these mega, um, farm corporations and they're trying to run the little man out of business. So when you have the ability to control the weather, you also have the ability to control life and death to control industry. And, you know, that's why I push for so much transparency. Um, and, and what's fascinating to me is that while they continue to push the stratospheric aerosol injection, um, you know, solution, band-aid for climate change, they quietly admit that, you know, aircraft exhaust that creates cirrus clouds are really the problem. Um, that, you know, cirrus clouds are trapping heat around the world and that if they do cirrus cloud thinning or cirrus cloud seeding, that they will never have to do stratospheric aerosol injection. So, you know, I see a lot of, um, you know, double speak coming from the IPCC yeah. crowd uh, where, you know, on the one hand, publicly in their reports, they say, you know, it's this bad and, you know, solar radiation management may be the only solution um, when, you know, I, you know, I always look at history. And in America, we had severe climate change. It was called the Dust Bowl. And during the Dust Bowl, uh, you know, basically people had cleared large portions of of ground by tilling it up and cutting down trees and they over farmed everything to the point where we had massive dust storms and all of this and to solve it we didn't do solar radiation management we didn't do any you know of these you know plans they're talking about today the united states planted 220 million trees um and that was to create wind breaks and so you know, common sense approaches to climate change are like out the window. Um, and, you know, what you're talking about with weather moderation and being able to take a more gentle approach to the climate um, as opposed to creating a global sunscreen to deal with the issue um, is really where I, I take, you know, I'm, I'm at odds with the IPCC and their assessments of all of this because they you know on the one hand say don't listen to these people you know listen to these people who are funded by the national science foundation and bill gates and yeah. you know that sort of thing so i see you know a clear agenda there um you know yeah. favoring one technology over another and you know yeah. th i think that's where the lobbyists come in um, but sure. before, before we go any further, I just want to jump back to, um, 2012, you paired up with a company called Cy Blue to, to do a test in Texas. I found this one particularly interesting because, um, you know, the Texas drought was pretty severe and, uh, you know, the idea was to, you know, bring moisture in from the Gulf of Mexico to Texas. And it seems like you had pretty clear evidence that it worked. Um, could you tell us, yep. uh, you know, as little or as much about this project as you like? Sure. Okay, great. Uh, look, I was delighted to be in America. I realized that a lot of the weather issues that you have over there are quite a bit more severe than what we experience regularly here. Uh, particularly tornadoes and the, the whole corridor of, of tornadoes. Um, 
and uh, and some of the other large hurricanes. So uh, I was pretty excited and a little naive, but I soon learned that there was another objective in that project. Um, it wasn't so much just to get rain, but it was to try to capture IP from our project. I found myself uh, operating in an old Air Force base where later I discovered microphones had been embedded in the walls. I went back a year later and visited and found a whole bunch of holes in the rooms where I was at that time working and, and there would obviously been something planted in the walls, microphones, cameras, detection devices, I don't know. So I became aware of that and called off um, the project in the end. But uh, at the time, I'd worked fairly hard, and I believe we did get rain in. And the team, uh, Mr. David Kuczynski, a gentleman I respect highly for his military background and work with people uh, and, uh, and technologies, and he, he was very enthusiastic. Um, he'd been through what I could basically, um, what could best be described as a harm's way in Iraq a couple of times and uh, seen a lot. And... I guess I had and still have a lot of compassion for those guys that have been through uh, the most difficult of all situations where their their friends and, and brothers and sisters have been killed, um, you know, in the military. And so I would hope to work on a solution we could then roll up and scale up for a national application. But once I discovered that they were after... Um, my intellectual property and that he was going behind my back to my business partners uh, in uh, other parts of the world that I had to sort of part ways. Um, but uh, notwithstanding that, we uh, we worked hard to get some rain in. We did get good rain, I believe, in as planned, uh, a demonstration there. And I think you've, I've seen some of your charts that you've recorded, uh, Jim, that shows that. So, um I think the experience was great. Uh, we've learned a lot in this type of thing, uh, and we can help um, in the future. But for now, we had to part ways with, with our company and the parties involved, um, although there are some valuable contacts that have been made. And um, since then, also, we, we've done a fairly large-scale demonstration, 2013, involving a former government employee, I think he likes to be called, but he was involved with one branch of the US military at a fairly high level, and he witnessed a very successful outcome. I'm not permitted to give his name and details, but they are avail available for an appropriate audience, you know, because he's, his life's work is with credibility in military and security and government related, and he had NORAD counter check our results against what I said versus what Noah said would happen. And basically the results came in on side with what we predicted and, and said that we were doing. And Noah were left floundering, basically. And so it was yeah, such the, a significant... The, the, the rainfall anomaly chart uh, pretty much says it all. Um, okay. Yeah. And okay, so I've covered Colonel David Kaczynski in detail um, in a couple articles, they're in uh, my atmospheric river section on climateviewer.com. But um, he is possibly one of the most interesting people I've ever heard of in my entire eight years of doing research on this topic. Um, the guy's a sniper. He jumps out of airplanes. He trained the FBI in martial arts. Um, he makes bottled yeah. water. He uh, made a custom bred uh, bacteria for the BP oil spill. And apparently, yeah. um, he steers, uh, you know, is into atmospheric rivers. He wrote a um, paper called Using the Rivers of the Troposphere. Uh, where one of his quotes that I use all the time, water will be to the next century what oil was to the last. The, the, the most interesting part about it is if you go to his website now, Cy Blue, you'll also realize that he is also a private investigator, hacker, and is you know obviously capable of installing microphones in somebody's wall. So, it, you yep. know, it, it's kind of... I, I'm I, I'm thankful that you actually shared that you know in the video. I didn't expect you to. You know we discussed this previously on the phone, but you know that's that's where it always goes back to is that 
you know, all of the information is gathered, you know, on everybody who does weather modification research. And it ends up at China Lake, California for the U.S. Naval Research Lab and Wright-Patterson Air Force Base for the Air Force Research Lab. And these two locations, since Operation Popeye in Vietnam, where they did weather warfare over Laos, um, the CIA was involved in it and Henry Kissinger. Henry Kissinger and the CIA didn't even tell the Secretary of Defense they were doing the, the weather yep. warfare over Vietnam. So it is yeah. not surprising to me that, you know, you come in with good intentions and the military is literally bugging your room to learn everything they can about this because, yeah. you know, the, the kind of technology that you're talking about is extremely powerful stuff, you know, if, you know, scaled up. Um, and, yeah. you know, they certainly have the budget to scale it up to do some serious sure. damage. So we, we flash forward to today and you've got a brigadier general from Iran saying, liter uh, literally accusing Israel of stealing its reign. They said they accused Israel of cloud theft. The CIA also in the six in the sixties, um, late sixties, did a project called Nile Blue, where they were doing cloud seeding over the Gulf of Mexico to make all the rain fall in the ocean before it reached the island so they could dry up um, Castro's sugar crops and kill them. Um, so, yeah. you know, these kinds of nefarious activities, you know, are obviously a fascination of my audience. And that's why yeah. I've put forward a solution, the Environmental Modification Accountability Act, um, to, yeah. to bring about, you know, transparency and verification through the use of atmospheric sensors for good. So that, you know, cool. on, the, on, on the front hand, people like you that are trying to do good, trying to stop drought, you know, stop floods, um, you know, save people's lives, uh, you know, with good intentions, that that technology is not then used to, you know, say, steer a hurricane into a rival country or destroy crops, you know, for economic purposes or to benefit one country or company over another. Um, yeah. So, I mean, you, you, you would obviously support something like that. Yeah, absolutely, Jim. I think uh, where we'd have to go with that is ultimately to United Nations and try to get them on board to say, yeah, it makes sense, certainly for civilian uh, applications for private companies and government approved projects, that there's an accountability and transparency globally. My concern today is that the unaccountable um, military have assets and programs and budgets that they're not even, don't even think they're accountable for. Uh, that may be operating at a very high level um, as far as the atmosphere goes and that in fact, um, you know, the earth, some of the macro effects that are damaging economies and, and stable rain systems that you would expect to have with a sphere orbiting the sun in a stable orbit you, and rotating um, systematically that we're going to get stable seasons but where you've got an obstruction of stable seasons going on uh, and you know particularly what we've observed here in Australia in Victoria where just at the time of the crops become ripe for harvest in comes some unpredicted major weather threat which we had um, 2017 December the 1st was a was a flood event they started sandbagging country towns and Melbourne uh, the premier dismissed government workers they said the floods are going to be so bad but I was funded with my project to protect our Wimmera target here in northwest Victoria from this flood event. And, and we got the event to jump and it missed the crops. It didn't damage the crops and it even didn't damage Melbourne. It jumped Melbourne as well. So that we've basically been able to um, avert a threat event that we think likely was part of this sort of macro interference. So I don't want to become the enemy of these operators and, and many of whom may fly aircraft uh, for fees and have um, have this as their job to feed their family. You know, I'm not out to create, um, uh, to become a soft target like yourself. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that's not your objective, uh, but rather that we might be a force for change for some sensible, um, proactive, uh, pro forma 
for future operations, for particularly the likes of those that have budgets with uh, almost unlimited numbers of zeros that can, uh, can do what they want. So I think the military has to have a level of accountability. Governments must be accountable. Even in an international opponent, governments must be accountable. And we have some tools here that we've developed that I guess it's probably my, it's my life's work and I think uh, I've been more guarded about this than anything. Uh, I don't blame if you. we forward, uh, Jim, with perhaps collaborating with you and others, perhaps in your audience, where we could build a, a template that we could then uh, run it past the United Nations and try to get a bit of a private and public uh, agreement that, that this template would bring some sensibility to the whole thing. Um, you know, we have a chance. We have a chance to to help be a force for good and, and eventually reel in the likes of Monsanto and others that have practices we don't know. You know, they're unaccountable, they're privately driven, they're, they're you know, they're after profit. Um, I'm particularly not. I'm after, you know, survivability and, and the quality of life of humanity forever on this beautiful planet. Okay, it won't be forever, but it will be, it could be for the next you know, a couple of thousand years if we kept and reel in a little bit. You know, uh, can I just mention uh, part of my proposal, and I haven't aired this really publicly, is that we develop an agricultural branch of robotics and AI that we can then have military industrial organisations invest into so that we can do things like green, uh, start to green the likes of the Sahara and other deserts and create a bit of a sand lockdown so we don't get sand drift over Saudi Arabia, a project they might be interested in because their agriculture, a third of Saudi's agriculture is in the northwest and is threatened by this sand drift from Sahara Desert. Now, with a, a project that they could help fund, mm -hmm. uh, that we could bring the greening of the Sahara, at least to create a lockdown and support the natural uh, plant life and seeds that are there waiting for the rains we could protect Saudi's agriculture, you know, and so on, so that we could create a greater food bowl um, input for the planet and then ultimately translate this military industrial technology for agriculture through to the likes of Mars and other places where we're going to need to apply similar um, hardened, intelligent technologies to desert greening. Yeah, uh, terra terraforming okay. other Probably. planets. So, yeah, yeah. what you're what you're Start basically, here. yeah, I mean, that we already are, in my opinion, and 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 that's really you know where we go back to weather modification history. That you know because of what happened in Vietnam, they passed the Environmental Modification Convention or the prohibition of hostile use of the environmental modification techniques in 1978. The problem is yep. that they never made a way for people to be caught um, doing hostile environmental modification or, um, you know, what they said was long term or hostile um, or military for that matter. So really, it, it's very it's eerily similar to the limited test ban treaty where they ban nuclear weapons. And what I yep. saw happen was they banned nuclear weapons, but then they created an international monitoring system, which is run by the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty Organization. And they put infrasound recorders and seismic recorders around the globe in order to monitor, you know, for the signatures of a nuclear blast so they could triangulate it and know where it happened. And, you know, from 1978 to present, there still is no way to tell if somebody has intervened in the weather in a macro scale or even a micro scale, and there are no global laws on weather modification reporting. So, you know, yep. that's, that's my solution um, is the Environmental Modification Accountability Act, and it does involve the United Nations because ap apparently the only thing that's necessary to make this a reality is for one nation state being the state department to go to the un security council and propose an amendment it's that simple then there's one un security council vote and then it becomes law 
So what I've proposed yeah. is that there be an international registry and um, of atmospheric experimentation events that people give at least a minimum of a 48 hour notice before doing an experiment. Um, when I've talked to geoengineers and other scientists who are in the biz, they say it should be much longer than 48 hours, but at the very minimum, 48 hours prior to, so that if you end up causing a tornado or you know d damaging property, life, or limb, that people can hold you accountable in a court of law, you know, via lawsuits, but that you know there's some accountability there, and anybody who does not tell in advance that they were going to do an experiment that they're held accountable um, because they're clearly hostile. You broke the law already. Why didn't you tell us what you were doing? So how do we catch those people? We do it with atmospheric sensors. And I say it's a two part um, system. One where we get all of the atmospheric sensors that are owned by the universities, the governments, the corporations, and build, you know, connect them together, similar to what they did for nuclear um, testing, but also have a citizen-powered network as a check and balance. So, yeah. you know, my my goal in the long term was to create a climate viewer for your backyard that watched your sky, took atmospheric measurements, measured for electromagnetic radiation. Um, measure, you know, the actual chemical constituents of your rainfall samples in real time and put all this out on the internet on a map in real time. So that's the yep. ultimate goal is to, you know, to, to bring some accountability to this, you know, crazy world, which is so secretive. I mean, most people don't know that we've been modifying the weather for 200 years, let alone that, yep. you know, right now we're in a situation where, Similar to what you're talking about, Climate Control Global Trading LLC and the government of China are now talking about steering atmospheric rivers using air corridors to shift clouds and rainfall hundreds of miles away, um, to you know use ionospheric modification technology to steer hurricanes. Um, Climate Global Control Trading LLC even created a cryptocurrency called the Climate Crime where they're going to sell water by the barrel with cryptocurrency. So if, you know, water is such a great resource and that it could have such devastating effects on life, you know, and property and, you know, everybody's blaming it on CO2. Um, I think that, you know, not only as my solution, you know, with the amendment to the NMOD, um, you know, law, uh, a proper solution, but what you're talking about with weather moderation, could literally be, you know, the kryptonite for the the bad actors, you know, if properly implemented. So, um, I mean, what what's your thoughts on that sort of thing? I know, you know, like you said, nobody wants to be a target. I certainly don't. I have kids. I want to live my life very long. I want to grow old on on the porch with my my wife. But at the same time, you know, we have to be a force for change and a force for good um, in this world. And, you know, obviously, weather modification is the natural progression of man's control over nature. We've always done it, um, but it has to be done responsibly. And, I, you know, I think that where you're talking about with weather moderation and, you know, using it um, for good to stop floods, to protect crops, um, you know, with, if done with transparency and accountability that you're to be applauded for that and and not you know sh you know shunned by the united nations or obvious you know yeah. silly people who are on debunking websites that this is a serious yeah. issue yeah that's right so uh just to answer that uh i think that if the government and military had a reason to invest in sensors and a collaboration to highlight, let's say they were afraid in North America that China's work might extend beyond the boundaries of sovereign China and Russia or any other country, etc., uh, that then they would be able to assist in developing the countermeasure legal framework and sensor mechanism to trap them, just as with nuclear, as you've uh, really well highlighted. Um, 
that if then we get them to invest in that other side so that the military, as it were, was helping to um, make sure that America wasn't susceptible to um, inappropriate environmental influences that have been directed out of other countries, then that will help us to get a collaborative solution in place with the UN involvement. Uh, so I see that and I see the need to develop some bandwidths of um, what's sensible, permittable, natural variance for seasons and versus what is outside our models and our historic examples. And, and if something's appearing to be an anomaly, then it's being driven by an anomaly and there's a reason for it and we should be able to analyse that. But I've noticed in Australia um, that, for example, we get beautiful satellite images courtesy of um, JMA out of Japan, but the satellite image resolution is just um, cut off just at the point at which we'd be able to identify, um, you know, high-level chemtrails or other behaviours that have been triggered by aircraft um, to, to disrupt atmospheric patterns. And so you're getting a resolution that's suitable for the evening news and for mums and dads to look at the cloud patterns. But if we want to, um, you know, uh, analyse where the jet flight paths are and how they may have influenced the pressure system flow paths, for example, we, we just don't get that resolution. But uh, so the tools are all available today. The technology's here. The supercomputing is getting more high resolution. We're able to now look at events ahead of time up to 10 days in pretty good resolution in Australia. And then we can build a solution to mitigate an incoming threat that's within that 10 day window. So I'm gonna try and get funding up for a, a corporate resource that will allow, will allow operations to flag threats ahead of time. And one of the ideas I had, Jim, to run past you was that if we had um, a situation where there was a, a threat to life, to, to population centres, a threat of um, a, a potential a flood event or a, let's say a storm event that, that threatened lives, uh, that we might be able to collaborate towards a solution that ultimately, whether initially just uh, operating in Australia, but ultimately we could offer globally, certainly to the US, where... Um, as supercomputing and other modelling and forecasters predicted such a threat, then we flag that threat on a, let's say, a global map that's an operational map that um, your audience might be able to log into and see current live threats, then also see events where we may endeavour to mitigate, and we'd, we'd be very careful about mitigating a tornado threat, for example. We wouldn't just divert it because we might... We might kill people, you know. This is a it's a it's a difficult subject, but we've been involved in events where we didn't deploy, we didn't execute, and there might have been a forces applied against us to not engage, and where people's lives have been lost. And it's an incredible struggle to um, to work with this kind of technology. And where's the moral and ethical lines? Yeah, but let's exactly. say you let's say you identified with your audience a threat to a to a corridor across a couple of states of tornadoes in two days' time, that might be an event that I could get uh, support here to to execute a program to uh, disassemble the threat configuration before the tornadoes form. Then we, we record the outcome. Your audience sees the developments and record and so on, and then we start to build a merit that can be tabled also and that that others can pay attention to, I believe we have a tool worth contending with in that arena where the others are playing, where the big corporates that are not telling anyone and, and likely they they hope they never will what they're doing, uh, I believe we have a tool set that can provide localised countermeasures that we could build such merit that could easily then be presented at United Nations level that could bring your treaty concept to the table um, which, uh, you know, this can be hammered into an international agreement that well, wouldn't it be fantastic to, to try I, and build? I, yeah, it's, it's national security um, for every country. And, you know, to, to really highlight that, especially here in America, 
Professor Alan Robach, who is a very famous geoengineering scientist, said, quote, I got a phone call from two men who said we work as consultants for the CIA and we'd like to know if some other country was controlling our climate, would we know about it? I told them after thinking about it a little bit that we probably would because if you put enough material in the atmosphere to reflect sunlight, we would be able to detect it and see it with the equipment that was see the equipment that was putting it up there. At the same time, I thought they were probably also interested in if we could control somebody else's climate, could they detect it? And that really is the the the, the serious nature of what's going on. Um, and then you have the natural, you know, weather, you know, events that could be mitigated if we had proper detection systems. But um, another YouTuber uh, went to the weather modification conference that they have at the American Meteorological Society and actually got the uh, NOAA's uh, uh, National Weather Service Storm Prediction Center, uh, you know, president and asked him. When people modify the weather in America, um, do you work that into your um, your uh, forecasts? And his exact quote, and I, you can't make this up, was, uh, well, they don't actually tell us when they're modifying the weather. Which was a flat out lie, because since 1972, there was the Weather Modification Reporting Act of 1972 that states in America, you have to submit a report to NOAA before you modify the weather and when you are done. So before, during, and after, you report all weather modification activities to NOAA. Um, so for him to you know, be on record saying, no, we don't even account for cloud seeding or any other kind of weather modification activities in our predictions. Uh, no, they don't even tell us. It was a flat out bull faced lie. And that's, that's what concerns me so much. So I went to the Weather Modification Conference this year um, in January, and that's why I was interviewing, you know, people from, you know, uh, the United States Naval Research Lab. I asked them about HARP. I talked to Raytheon um, and all these cloud seeding scientists. And they all seemed, you know, kind of like, holy crap, I can't believe I'm being asked these questions. And you know, yeah, that's where that's really where we're at. Is that yeah. we've come to a place now where we know what's going on. It just we need somebody to do something about it. And yeah. I think that between you know proper legislation, bringing you know trust but verify to the weather warfare ban of 1978, and using you know. Um, proper detection tools like I've tried to build that myself on climateviewer.org with climateviewer 3D where you know you have all the satellites of the world from the NASA global image browsing service to Mateo sat um, you know next rad um, radar uh, Doppler radars you know try to bring every sensor possible into one application but like you said it's gonna take supercomputers some very experienced programmers and be able to, you know, just like we have, um, you know, Noah giving off tornado alerts saying, Hey, you know, every cell phone's ringing going, there's a tornado in your area seeks shelter that we yeah. can flag these events. And, you know, especially if the technology is there, like you're claiming with weather, um, moderation that we could flag these events and then possibly prevent them that would be even yeah. better so um sure i really appreciate you doing this interview i hope to have a follow-up interview where we can get a little bit further into weather moderation um i'd like for everybody to check out uh miles research on twitter and on uh, youtube he's got three videos up there on his youtube channel um, and it's milesresearch.co is his current website. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add before we wrap this up, man? I really appreciate you doing this interview. No problem. It's been great. Uh, look, Jim, I think uh, one thing that's been on my mind is that amongst your audience, there's an untold resource there. And we're trying to build a, a facility 
this year and and get up and running where we've got a resource that we can start to apply to not just commercial opportunity but to humanitarian opportunities that will save lives in U.S. cities and in other places. Uh, we want to try and solve some of the problems of the red tape and and how to get around some of the longer processes required to go through government, whether we could crowdfund a mitigation endeavour that is still legal, you know, that legally, you know, a doctor can pull over to the side of the road and save someone's life within the constraints and parameters that the law permits. But there are some problems with people stepping out of their comfort zone and helping others that when those people might be sued, you know, so our company are worried about others suing us. We're looking for a way to to navigate forward safely and who knows, some of your team, some of your audience and others uh, that get to see some of your material could contribute to this. And I believe we'll do it. You know, I believe it's possible. We'll win some of the military corporations on board to develop new agricultural systems that can deploy robots to help us so that we can adjust the weather systems and, and therefore manage seed growth and and heal some of the lands that have just been suffering, in fact, through the centuries, and then address some of the food issues. So I just believe in you guys. I believe in what you're doing. And let's see what we can do this year, 2019. I appreciate that. And, and you know, from my perspective, it, it's no different than the whole atomic bomb problem at this point. It's mutually assured destruction. So it is in the interest of the United States military, the Chinese military, the Russian military to develop systems to detect these sorts of things. Um, so, there, you know, there's no reason not to at this point. And there, you know, there's already an agreement on the books that says we shouldn't be doing this anyway. So why not, you know, once and for all, you know, put the, you know, put the money, put your money where your mouth is and let's guarantee that there aren't nefarious actors on a global scale um, creating climate change disasters um, and that they start working towards, you know, fixing some of these because the technology is clearly there. I just don't believe yeah. it's being used for the right purposes in many cases. Yeah. And, you know, with the secrecy around it, you know, we never will know without the participation of, you know, the military industrial complex. So there has to be some kind of happy medium. And as far as the geoengineering scientists, you know, they've even agreed that, you know, we agree that transparency is a must and verification would be great. So the scientific community, everybody I've approached about this has said, this is cool with me. Um, I have not been able to obviously talk to the military about this because aside from the one interview I got from an NSA guy on my beach vacation with my family, um, <laughs> other than that, uh, you know, I haven't spoken to any three letter agencies about this, but clearly there's a need yeah. and there's a need to be able to use technology for good to, you know, mitigate drought, to, to be able to stop, um, you know, Bernard Eastland talked about the thunderstorm solar powered satellite to, you know, literally a satellite in space to snuff out, um, tornadoes. So people are going to pursue this stuff. I just wanted to, you know, be responsible and transparent. And I think that you, you know, you obviously agree with that. And I hope that people will look into your project and that you do find funding because you seem to be one of the good guys and you've been very open and transparent with me and my audience. And I greatly appreciate that. So once again, everybody, David Miles, CEO of Miles Research. You can find him at milesresearch.co. Please uh, put your email in there. Um, get the white paper. Um, go to Miles Research. Just search for Miles Research on youtube watch the videos there um i'll obviously provide those in the article um that i'm gonna in include this video in and uh, i want to thank you once again for being so um open and honest with me david um it's a pleasure to finally meet you in person and be able to speak with you after studying your company and technology for four years now um this has truly been a pleasure
Mine too, Jim. Thanks very much. Thank you. All right. So, guys, there he is. He's a real person. You've heard, you've actually seen David Miles, the man, the myth, the legend, the, the, the acquiesce guy I've been talking about for years. It's a real thing. Um, and I hope that you guys will take a look at his literature. Um, I've actually got a very lengthy paper from him that we're probably will discuss at a later date on the weather moderation, um, you know, techniques. I kind of wanted to just give an overview of his history and, you know, bring you up to date on uh, where the technology is and wh what his intentions are. And I think we've done an excellent job of that. Um, I appreciate everybody who's tuned into this. Um, and, you know, like he said, maybe we can global, you know, do like a GoFundMe to literally create a weather protection system um, that, you know, is going to be used for good for people um, that are so concerned about, you know, nefarious actors. Um, and, you know, of course, I hope that everybody will continue to support the Environmental Modification Act. You can find that. Um, at climateviewer.com slash nmod. And of course, everything that you just saw is free of charge. You're free to remix this video, put it on your YouTube channel. Um, all I ask is that you support, continue to support my work at patreon.com slash climateviewer or with a one-time donation at PayPal or GoFundMe. Those are always greatly appreciated. So now you know and knowing is half the battle. And with information comes great power, and with great power comes great responsibility. So please use this information you've learned today to attack ideas, not people.